So, so prison radio is um, committed to airing voices of people living inside prisons. And for the most part, we've done U.S. prisons, but not exclusively. Um, and we and not our very first programming, but early programming and a dominant element of our programming for many years was uh, was really to uh, give uh, Mumia Abu Jamal, who was a trained journalist before he was imprisoned, an opportunity to share his work. Um, and we see him as a as one of the leading intellectual figures alive in the United States today. And so, um, but we had. Me, I just saw this talk by Angela Davis at the, uh, she just got this award. She and Ruthie Gilmore and Mike Davis got this Lannan prize. Um, and so I just saw a, a panel with them and they asked Angela how she began um, doing prison work. And she, and, and she is actually one of the people who organized me into doing prison work, but she said exactly the same thing. I would say that she initially began uh, politically organizing around prisons in support of political prisoners. And that was true for Noel and I when we launched Prison Radio. But you only have to do that for a very brief period of time before you start asking larger questions about prisons, who they're serving, what purposes, you know, why, how much they cost, who's paying the consequence, are they there to keep us safe, or are they there as an apparatus of control, right? All of those things become very quickly evident. So we, so initially we did a, a 13 part series at the Dublin Federal Correctional Institute. Um, with political prisoners and prisoners of war women um, who were there. Um, and they said, uh, you have to find a way to record Mumia, who was on, at the time on death row in Pennsylvania. And, um, and they said it very aggressively. And so we said, OK, we have to figure it, even though we're this scrappy, newly launching pro project in San Francisco with zero funding and no personal wealth, we have to um, find a way to get to do that. And so, uh, you know, we maxed out credit cards and we made connections and we went to, and this was in the early 90s, we went into uh, to Huntington State Prison, which is in the middle of Pennsylvania, and into this fortress institution, which I think has subsequently been closed. It was a large brick institution. It was very formidable. It was 105 degrees out. Um, and we didn't have a car with, you know, we had borrowed someone's car, it didn't have air conditioning, you know, we didn't have, uh, we had uh, borrowed equipment, we had, um, and, and Noelle Hanrahan, um, who I think, you know, really, I want to give her a lot of credit for being so intrepid. She insisted on getting permission. She made the prison let us in. She made the prison, you know, we, I said, there's no way, because even though we had permission in advance, I said, there's no way they're going to let us into this prison with this equipment. But, but she has never been um, intimidated by um, those kinds of obstacles. And we got in and it was very challenging recording conditions because Mumia was behind glass and, uh, he couldn't bring any paper into the visit. He strip searched before each visit and after each visit. And so he was going to read commentaries. So we had to bring the commentaries and we had to tape them to the glass. And we had to get the guard to bring a mic around and um, onto the other side so he could be mic'd, which was, you know, every step of the way was a challenge. And this is our very first visit. And we had a little DAT recording device. This is before any of this any you know mm -hmm. streaming and um and then he started to speak and then we realized in a way that because he his voice was not commonly available before and we hadn't heard very much of his work before because it just wasn't possible to hear it um but as soon as he started to speak we realized we had a grade a radio talent that we just hadn't a hundred percent understood before and Noel turned to me, this is my favorite opening story about prison radio. Noel turned to me and said, you have to get them to turn the air conditioning off because it's creating a hum and it's interfering with their sound quality. And I said, this is a giant prison and it's 105 degrees out and they hate us. There is just no way that they're going to turn off the air conditioning for the institution in order for us to do this interview. And she said, make them do it. And so I left the room and I went to the woman sitting at the desk and I said, I need you to turn off the air conditioning because it's creating an unworkable hum. And she looked at me and she said, what? And I thought to myself, this woman is never going to turn off the air conditioning. And I said, you have to turn off the air conditioning. And then 
she got up and she turned off the air conditioning, which it just proves you never get anything unless you demand it, right? And so, um, you know, it's really, there's this phrase, you know, there's a book that we like, you know, when we fight, we win. And it's really true even at, like at every stage, right? At every stage. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was our first, um, and we recorded probably... 15 commentaries that session and then we came back several years and in those days you had a little dat tape and you had to go to you know have a little editing station at your house and you're at kpfa and then you'd like have to physically get the tape to all of the radio stations we did that for a long time um and but then as technology changed we were able to really expand our program and now we have over 100 correspondents who call in from all over the country so mumia's health he'll tell you he's great and he's not exactly great. He's um, so he had a emergency um, bypass surgery, maybe a year ago now, um, and so he's working. He's living with heart disease and with the remnants of the hepatitis that we were that he um, that we were able to get treated. Um, so he so this was a beautiful story. He I mean it was terrible but beautiful. He had hepatitis and the policy of the prison was only to treat hepatitis at its very latest stages um and so we which, because treating it is very expensive and so prison radio worked with um progressive lawyers in pennsylvania and sued the department of corrections of pennsylvania and got mumia treatment but that resulted in everyone in the prisons getting treatment so um and this is one of the things about mumia's case is that every time he's had a victory it's had a kind of cascading impact on other people but um, so, but now he's living with heart disease in prison, and it's you know anybody who knows anything about heart disease, uh, the key elements to heart recovery is uh, eating well and getting exercise, and those are impossible in prisons. And as our correspondents age, right, as the as the boomers get older, the boomers in prison get older, we see the consequences of people living for. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years in an institution where they have, you know, high sodium diets uh, with with no fruits and vegetables, very limited opportunities for exercise and um, and no kind of uh, uh, food options. Right. So that, you know, there's this, you know, movement coming out of of the Bay Area. Right. Decolonize your diet. Right. So. Uh, they these people these are people living with a colonized diet for sure and those are habits you know I talked to someone who had gotten out after 35 years and he said I I don't know that I can ever and he had diabetes and heart disease and he said it it's really hard to change the way that I've eaten that I've been forced to eat for my whole adult life and and so for him even living outside it was hard to manage his diabetes and heart disease um, and I think, and for Mumia, it's an, it's an endless struggle. And so that's one of our calls right now is we have a postcard campaign to the Department of Corrections um, to improve the eating and exercise options because we have an aging prison population. And, these, and so we're looking at, so again, in, so, in this and in so many ways, Mumia's case is both ordinary and extraordinary. And, um, and he, and this is, you know, our... Our tagline is liberating voices, and it's not that we're liberate. It's, it's in part that we see ourselves as liberating the voices of people in prison, but it's also that we see their voices as liberating us because we understand the conditions that we actually all live in um, if we understand the conditions in prisons. And because the hope and resilience that people living inside prison have to offer is something that is a precious commodity that we should all be... Uh, I say everybody should visit a prison. Everybody should try to find a way to visit a prison because you can't understand the the world you live in if you can't see its its largest apparatus, you know? And and every time you think, "Oh, why does my kid have a classroom of 35 students?" or there was just a story about Buena Vista Horace Man where there's gas leaks and vermin and um, it's too hot and too cold and people bring blankets. And my kids went to Buena Vista Horace Man. You know, my kids went to Horace Man. So, you know, these are the conditions our children are being educated in. And the reason is because as a community, we have decided instead to invest in these extremely expensive apparatuses that hold people in prison for decades and decades and decades. And we can see this through, you know, Mumia's story only illustrates um, these common threads and mm -hmm. phenomenons. Mm -hmm. So the Black Panthers came out of Oakland because the 
police misconduct, the police violence was so profound in Oakland. That's really police violence is why there is a Black Panthers. And it's police violence in Oakland specifically is why there was ever a Black Panthers. Now, I just want to say one thing about this idea that people being in prison for for kind of trumped up charges, which is not, um, that's not a small matter. That really, there was a, a very large program from the federal government to identify um, powerful leaders and to find any mechanism possible to take them down. And it was called COINTELPRO, and it's extensively documented. And that is what took down all of the, the many of the leaders in the Black Panther, and they and and trumped up charges or opportunistic charges were part of it. But were so were long protracted legal battles. So were um, kind of vindictive arrests, and so were a myriad myriad other tactics. Right. So it was there was a, a really a concerted governmental program to destroy the social movements of the late '60s, and it's important that people know that. And prisons were one important part of that, but they were prisons and police violence and police misconduct were a central element of that, but not the only one. So I really, that, so I think in terms of understanding, poli you know, w one, one of the reasons why um, activists hate prison so much, it's helpful to understand a little bit about this program, COINTELPRO. I wanted to say, you know, the other day I was addressing a classroom of people and it was unfathomable to me because I was speaking in this language that we started the right. conversation with, at, at, that when I was referring to this program, COINTELPRO, that is a matter of public record, right. that anybody can access. We know now the things that happened behind this this terrible federal program. And people scratch their heads, and I, maybe I'm hanging out with the wrong people, but I often get the, what do you mean? I mean, it's taken a long time for people to get up to speed. And again, this is why we rely on folks on the panel right. and and right. and books. You know, books are a real important element because that's something that can be passed around, and not everybody has internet access. So. I'm reiterating it like you were reiterating. There's a great it. book called the COINTELPRO Papers that just just reveal the paper, which were smuggled out by activists from a CIA office in Media, Pennsylvania. I mean, it's a great story all by itself. It's really like worthy of like a of a like a crime novel. It's by you know a movie like a James Bond movie or something. You know, like that right. that um, genre. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe we'll be ready for it. <laughs> Like, <laughs> right, right, right. Now. Well, right. Um, so, yeah, so pick up, you were saying, so um, the um, the various organizations that are devoted to liberating prisoners and, and mm -hmm. bringing the information that are located here grew out of that time. Yeah, and I think we have a, a, just a dynamic progressive movement here. We have, you know, the very serious tradition of black organizing. You have uh, a very, you wouldn't tell now, but there was a very rich world of feminist organizing here. Um, and you have your anti-war movements. You have various, very strong, you know, I, I think in, in the Bay Area, this idea of having uh, you know, because we live like at San Francisco State, you know, we have the only San Francisco State has the only college of ethnic studies in the country. It is the only college of ethnic studies with departments and specialized, you know, that that focus on different communities. And that was because of a student strike. Right. And that and people all talk about like Berkeley in the 60s. But actually, this this thing now, Gavin mm -hmm. Newsom just signed it in this bill that you have to take an ethnic studies class in order to graduate from California high school. That all began, critical race theory really launched out of ethnic studies, and that all came, not exclusively, but there was a, a big uh, and un often un under-recognized contribution from San Francisco State University's yeah. student strike. Yeah, I agree. I also want to go back to this idea of the contradictions in, in California and even the Bay Area that, that you pointed to. You know, we, we have the death penalty, for example. That's very mm -hmm. un-Californian, right? Uh-huh, uh, right. That's an right. issue. When we talked the first time, you talked about how tech and um, movement work were actually kind of joined in the early days mm -hmm. of your work. Mm -hmm. And I think these days we kind of see those as separate right. communities, right? Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, I don't have as much, and that's not like an area that I've really developed, but I mean, I think that the earlier moments of kind of tech 
you know, I think that there's a sense, there's a part of the innovative principle of tech work. You know, there's a reason that it came from here, right? And I, I think that this idea of questioning things and of doing things differently, you know, which Apple was happy to capitalize on as their tagline for a long time. Um, uh, uh, at this point, prisonradio.org. Um, if people would like to donate, is yes. there a yes, donation there's a, button? Yes, you donate, but there's a donation button. And we are run entirely by by gifts from, small gifts from individual donors. So please give us, give us a gift. Give us $20, give us $50, give us $1,000, give us whatever you can. Because we are really, it is a string and a prayer that we, that we run our operation on. So um, everybody's part-time, every, you know, it's like we have a host of volunteers. But I, yeah, so um, moving toward a better and brighter future, we have to end on hope. Because right, you always right. do, and so does Mumia. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.